and I guess that the pressure was that you never feel like it's enough. You never feel like you're doing enough or, or giving enough or creating enough because, you know, in a sense, we are, we've created this opportunity for all these people, these beautiful people to work for us. And now it's been taken away and they're sort of looking to us for the next move. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. During the series, we've heard from a few operators who opened restaurants during the pandemic. There have been many who have been forced to close their businesses forever. And although it's hard to believe, there have also been some who have sold restaurants during the pandemic. Hayley Hardcastle is the co-owner of Saddles at Mount White. Hayley, how are you going? Hello. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Good. Now... Hayley, at the start of the pandemic, you had two restaurants, Saddles and Bombini at Avoca Beach. But during July, you sold Bombini. Can you tell us about that? Uh, yep, I can. Um, so I guess, yep, selling a restaurant at any time is, is always a win. So I feel like selling a restaurant during a pandemic was, was <laughs> I guess, one up on that. <laughs> and uh, we were... You know, we weren't actively selling the business um, prior to the prior to COVID, but we did uh, have a few people interested, and we had someone approach us sort of the start of the year, I'd say January, and we started we started talking, and and I and Cameron and I thought, well, you know, this could be our next step, and this could be for us, and I guess as as we move further into um, March, uh, the conversation was getting stronger, but then also we found that it became completely silent um, as soon as COVID hit. So we were sort of tracking, we're tracking along and um, somewhere during sort of April or, or late May, the conversation started again. And, and, you know, I was completely surprised that we were, we were still talking about selling the business and then um, it happened very easy. Um, and wow. it was very, <laughs> it felt like a, a very simple process and there wasn't a lot of motion involved and, um, which meant for me that it was the right time to do what we did for sure. So, um, and you know, now, now tracking with one restaurant and, you know, if we ever had to face that again, I guess entering it with one would be way better than two. <laughs> what was the reasons behind letting go of one of the uh, restaurants. I know they're in very different areas, and they often offer a very different proposition to the market. Um, look, as I said, we weren't we weren't actively searching to to sell or um, or wanting to let go. Um, the opportunity presented itself, and and at the time, because of the weight of you know everything that we'd experienced with COVID, it just felt like the right thing to do. Um, to simplify life a little bit and and we you know we had a really great time at Bombini and we we're very lucky we, you know it's it's one of the most beautiful places on the central coast and it's a very sought after property and it was it was just a very natural thing to do and um and looking you know looking back I, you know I wish we did a little bit sooner because it has, you know, changed life a lot for us. Can we have a look at the last uh, couple of months for you? You know, you sold a restaurant and you just mentioned that it's changed things a lot. But what, what has the pandemic been like for Saddles and also having let go of a restaurant? Um, look, I think, you know, it's it's right at the start of the pandemic. So, we'll go, so we'll sort of backtrack then. We'll go right to the beginning of when we when it was all starting to unfold and we weren't really sure what was happening. We were in that momentum, we're in the business and we sort of geared ourselves up for the let's do this, let's do takeaway, we're going to do menu, marketing, staffing, etc. cetera. Uh, and I think we sort of rolled with that and we pushed it. And then about two days later, I thought, well, hang on let's pull up a bit and really work out what is about to unfold here. And, um, you know, at that starting point, I realized that we were, probably we were doing things maybe for all the wrong reasons, you know, to sustain the momentum and to, the, to, to keep the social presence and to keep our staff employed rather than thinking about, you know, what the actual feasibility was or the longevity of us after the time of the pandemic 
coming, you know, changing or, you know, to the point we are now. And I feel like, you know, at that point and like being a business owner, we've always had to start from square one and we've always had to build like the drive and the social presence and the demand um, with little or with little or nothing. Um, so I believe that we could do it again. So we really just sort of sat tight then at the end of March for, you know, two to three weeks uh, until we knew a little bit more about, I guess, how JobKeeper would assist the reinvention of of the businesses at that stage. So um, I think we did it a little bit different. We didn't, you know, I I probably personally went a bit quiet <laughs> and I sort of switched off for a little bit while, while we were trying to process what the next step was. But, you know, I think rather than uh, we were confusing a lot of our a lot of my thoughts, my honest thoughts uh, and the things that I thought were great for the business. Um, I was confusing those at the time with maybe the opinions of everyone around me, like my friends, my colleagues, et cetera, and, and my landlords who, who were all having an opinion on what they thought would be the best option for us at the time. But, it, you know, it's coming out of it the other side. I realised that, you know, we are in a, in a great place right now and I feel like that that was probably due to some of those um quick quick thinking or you know all things that I did during that time for sure can you take us through some of those some of those things that you uh implemented to ensure the survival of the business uh so look you know at the time it didn't feel like it was going to be the survival of business um I you know those first two to three weeks of sitting tight was more about like sort of preservation and not, you know, we did the figures so many times on, you know, takeaway models. And I guess somewhere like we had two different, two different businesses in and we had to have slightly different approaches because um, saddles is completely in the middle of nowhere. (laughs) And, and it wasn't a, it wasn't going to be feasible to, yeah. Or it wasn't probably socially acceptable to, to promote people to get out and drive. So um, we we sort of just sort of shut that one down and, and, and we sort of collaborated our teams together. So uh, we shut that down and we, we, I guess, essentially we started from scratch. So we, we sort of picked whoever we could from, from both and combined them and, and we opened up a little um, collaborative menu from both, from both establishments outside of Bombini, we had this little shed that we sort of transformed into a little takeaway, and um, and, and it was really simple. It was a tiny shed. It had a, a plumbing coffee machine, and it was it was you know pies, sausage rolls, and and some sweets. And you know, I think definitely the pies saved us. <laughs> And I and I guess you'd see most most restaurants did flip into some sort of what bakery model during the time. So um, lucky for us, it was what we'd already known and what what we already did. So it was an an easy way to start, and 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 gradually we just sort of built the cash flow from there and then started again. And it was just you know each week we got a little bit stronger, and then each week we. Uh, built the team up a little bit more and we sort of took, you know, two more people on or four more people on and sort of we grew, we grew um, our opening like that. You mentioned that there was all sorts of advice from everyone sort of confusing things during that time, but what, what did you get right? What did you get wrong during that period? Yeah, look, I, I guess I'll start on what did I get right? Well, looking back now, I feel like that I made the right decision completely about, having an immediate lockdown and um or in, in stand down of the business i feel like that it meant that we weren't you know investing or spending money on a takeaway trade that in you know wouldn't really be financially benefit beneficial for us um so i feel like that that was a positive um uh, I feel like that if I had my time again, <laughs> I probably, w- I probably wouldn't, you know, I probably would be a better communicator, and I probably would plan a little bit better, and 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 be uh, a better leader as such for the, those around me. I spent a lot of times, a lot of a lot of time on the lounge with a 
a bottle of champagne or two. And <laughs> and I guess that's that's what got like burning people. <laughs> and I and I look, I'm not angry about that because that's one of my favorite things to do. But I just think I just think that I could have better spent my time in in planning for future things and and I guess that's just what happens when you're very overwhelmed and you have a lot of things going on and and you're you know everyone's looking to you for what is the next thing to do and and it's and it you know it's at that point that I probably could have structured my time or my days in those early t- days a little bit better but I guess it was just survival mode and that's what I needed to do to get through perhaps <laughs> what sort of pressures have you felt um th- during this period with the obligation to bringing staff back on and um running the business you sort of just mentioned that you feel like you um, got on top of things a bit better but you know there's a lot of things to deal with and a lot of uh people's salaries and wages and lives what 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 does that pressure felt like for you yeah i felt um you do feel all the pressure and i think it's about the well-being of staff as well. I felt that was one of the biggest pressures um, because I knew how I was feeling and and I was meant to be the one in control. So knowing, you know, thinking about my staff and how they might be feeling, I was, you know, it would always send me into a spin and um, I would always try to be like creating, I guess, motivational things to keep them engaged or to keep them participating in the business, even though there was no real business at that time. Um, and, and I, and I guess that the pressure was that you never feel like it's enough. You never feel like you're doing enough or, or giving enough or um, creating enough because, we, you know, in, in a sense we are, we, we've created this opportunity for all these people, these beautiful people to work for us. And, now it's been taken away and they're sort of looking to us for the next move. And um, it, it, it was a lot of, it was a lot to deal with. And I think that I was very lucky in that we had some, some of our staff were, and actually some of our staff's family were so generous with their time. And, um, and the thing about living in, a, I guess, a small community is that we had lots of our staffs or apprentices, mums and dads saying, Hey, you know, we're not working at the moment. We can come and work for free. What do you want us to do? Answer the phones, do this, do that. Wow. And, you know, and I, and that, that's a beautiful, it's such a beautiful thing. And I, you know, we're so lucky to have um, a team like that and the support of their families as well. Um, such a small community business. Yeah. With those pressures that you had during that time, how did it feel when in July when you let go of one of the restaurants? What sort of impact did it have on everything that you were doing? I think it, immediately I had more focus. Uh, immediately I felt a little bit lighter and we were able to um, we were able to bring both of our teams together. And we've always been, I guess, two venues but one team anyway, but it was nice to just have one focus and and it was nice to be able to like, streamline my you know, thoughts and ideas and 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 I, I guess we really needed it as well because you know with the current current lockdowns and um, you know restrictions on travel we're very fortunate in re- in regional New South Wales because the market is so strong at the moment uh, and there is this huge demand and. And being at Saddles, we're like the, I guess, like the epicenter of the travel alongside the, the M1 and and bringing both teams together was, you know, we, it, it was sort of happened for a reason, I guess. We needed, we needed that strength to pull it all, to pull it all back together. So we were very fortunate. During that early stages of, of the lockdown when uh, people weren't traveling, how did you feel about owning a a regional restaurant kind of in the middle of nowhere with heavily reliant on tourists? I I felt still, I look, I mean, to me, for me during that time, like I still felt, I felt, felt lucky for the community that we're in, but I, but I felt, I I was a bit unsure about how we were going to come back from this. And I guess the only thing I kept thinking of was right. Well, we were, we've always been in the middle of nowhere (laughs) and we made it, we made it happen one time. 
and we can make it happen again when the time is right for us. And I I was more probably stressed about balancing landlord expectations uh, and, you know, and my reasoning behind not opening for takeaway um, in the middle of nowhere or not offering, you know, those take-home boxes or whatever people were doing at the time. Um, And I guess that that was probably my biggest stress was wanting you know, I guess explaining myself and the justification of why we weren't doing it and, and you know, and not just not just in a business sense but also, so, you know, I was socially conscious of, you know, posting and promoting people to come outside of their homes and travel because that wasn't what the advice was to do. And, and the only way to get people to regional New South Wales is to say, hey, jump in your car and all come out together and 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 come for a day trip and you know and that is not something that we were able to talk about so um yeah and I, I guess it was just about explaining because there's pressures everywhere and I know that you know the all the people the suppliers and the, the landlords and everyone around everyone's in the same position and everyone's wondering why you're not doing that or why you are or and and it was about balancing the expectation of you know what staff were thinking, what I was thinking, what the landlord was thinking, you know, what and and making sure that we were all on the same page. As you mentioned, the regions are booming at the moment, but you still have uh, restrictions as well. And there's also the spot cases that are popping up around Sydney. How, what's some of the challenges in operating in those conditions? I feel I feel like now that probably let's take it back a month ago when we just started really understanding how to manage the day-to-day with the new COVID policies. I feel like it was a bit challenging and we were more for us and probably for a lot of restaurants, we're not really the cleaning and the scheduling and this and that and whatever. It's always, it's normal. We're doing all these things, you know, day in, day out. Um, but I think it, we're more, more socially aware that, you know, keeping being in a in a venue like Saddles and that people might sort of post things on social media that might be misinterpreted like someone's standing up or someone's doing this. So I think that that puts more pressure on you than actually, you know, we know what we're doing and we know that we've covered all bases and we're ticking the boxes every day. But I think that that's, and a lot of restaurants are probably more aware that, you know, social media is such a big thing and and it's, it's how people perceive from the outside what you're doing rather than you knowing that you're doing the right thing. Um, so it was more about, it's more about balancing that and and the expectation of people really, because, you know, even though you're doing all these things, you can still get, you know, scrutinized for, you know, why is he wearing a, a fluoro jacket? You, you know, you think that you could do better than that, you know, but I thought, well, hang on, did you enjoy your food and beverage? Why am I being scrutinized on, on my hygiene marshal (laughs) when when he's doing his, you know, but it's just those little things about you can never, you're always going to be, there's always going to be an issue. So it's just about trying to do, keep, you know, keep the staff, um, you know, and it is very busy at the moment. So keep the staff sort of on track and just doing the best that they can and, um, and managing the flow of people and, um, and, you know, as, as I said, even though we are restricted, um, the 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 dining has changed, and and I feel like especially at the moment that you know people are still working from home, that we're seeing those we're sort of bridging the gap at the moment between that midweek uh, midweek trade to weekend where they're all sort of morphing into one and and becoming just like normal trade days, and and I guess that's because of you know at the guests um behavioral changes and and working from home and um you know those at this stage that would be probably in Europe are are still taking those times the time that they had off and you know trying to use it as best they can so which is you know and I'm not it's not like all stars and moons don't get me wrong it's (laughs) I know I, I I know that at some point it's going to at some point we need to be prepared and that you know, one that, you know, anything could happen to us and it could, 
um, affect our business directly at any point in time. And two, that as soon as, um, let's say, borders open up or as soon as um, the international travel begins again, that we might really experience some real hardship in our businesses. Uh, and and I don't feel like I just I, this is I don't feel like right now is the normal. So we have to just prepare ourselves for. Uh, and once all the benefit once all the benefits start drying up, um, I feel like that we're going to start seeing what we're really what what the effect is really like in the industry. You took a chance on a restaurant in the middle of nowhere and made a real success of it. But how did Saddles all start? Uh, so we met, um, so Saddles is owned by John Singleton and we met John, Cameron and I, we worked um, at Bells at Kilcare, uh, in Kilcare. We worked there for seven years together and that's where we met. And during that time, and John was, at that time, John was the owner of that property, uh, the, the landlord. Uh, so what, so we sort of, we were there and then we opened Mombini and we were sort of keeping in. In, in contact with John still and I think it was around 2016 that he said hey I'm finally and it's been something that John had talked about forever I'm finally going to open this coffee shop and so by coffee shop it's this little modest little you know shack sort of looking hole in the wall coffee shop and he said uh, would you like guys be interested in doing it with us so uh, it was so 2016, it was a, a two-year plan. We worked with um, the architects um, and designers and, and you know, John to pull together the vision of what was meant to be the little coffee shop and, and it turned into something, well, it's, it's something completely spectacular and a little bit more, <laughs> a little bit more than a, um, than a coffee shop. So, and we we're very lucky for the opportunity. And, you know, and at the time we thought of, we knew that, we knew that the place was special. We knew that, you know, the, the story was special uh, and we knew that we could create something, but we didn't know that it would be as popular or as successful as it is today, for sure. We didn't, we didn't realise that um, it would be a, a destination venue like it is, for sure. You mentioned your time at uh, Bells at Kilcare, but how did how did you uh, get started in the in the industry? What drew you to it? Uh, I guess look, I've been in I've been I guess actively working since I was fourteen in many jobs, but I'm the eldest of six kids, so I think as a as the eldest of six kids, I was always whether I liked it or not, organising and cooking and entertaining and, you know, and I've always I'm always wanted to create like a beautiful experience um, for my family, all my friends, and I think that it came so natural to me. And I remember being really young and like eight years old and thinking, well, you know, one day I'd like to create my own restaurant and, and then fast forward and I just naturally sort of started working as a 14-year-old and think and in cafes and, um and abroad as well. And I think, you know, I found myself to be, I did try my hand at, at teaching at one point. I, and I thought, no, this is not for me. I didn't feel, you know, I didn't feel natural. And I remember, and I'm pretty lucky to find myself in a job or, well, and then in this industry that I love and, you know, most of the days don't really feel like work. So, um, you know, I will don't, you know, and I think that it's really important that we can try and find something like, you know, something that we do every day that we love doing. And, and don't get me wrong, there's been tough years. There's been a lot of success and a, and a lot of failure. And, you know, working with your husband's its own challenge at times. So let's, um, <laughs> um, so it's, yeah, as I said, it's not, it's not all roses. But, you know, I think for the most part, you know, we're very lucky. And, and you know, looking back to when COVID started, we probably were in like a bit of a, a stuck spot, you know, a bit of, um, we needed a shake up and, and it's been, and it was horrific. It was a, it was a shake up for sure. But I feel like that we're probably our stories more of a story of we've found some, you know, great light and great success. And we have a, 
you know, touch wood because it can change tomorrow, an amazing team, a collaborative team of both of our restaurants and um, and it's given us a little bit more time to be with them. You're about half an hour west of Gosford and um, south of Glenworth Valley. Uh, what's it like putting a menu together? Is there um, some good local producers that you can connect with? Yeah, definitely there is. Uh, so so Cam and our head chef, uh, Ricky, they, they put together the menu. Um, but our, our aim is to have like... Our aim is to create a menu that was an Australian bakehouse as such and we always try and use local or native ingredients where possible. Uh, And we have, especially recently because we're hosting an event with the local farmers, we've started connecting with our local farmers and it's incredible. There's so many um, many farmers and, and growers and, you know, anything from, you know, juices to veggie to beef to, you know, to eggs. You know, we we have we have more than probably anyone expects or understands. I think it's it's worth a uh, you know navigating that area because every anywhere from Pete's Ridge all the way, and I would consider like up to Yarramalong and then the Hunter. Like they're our that's our backyard. So we're pretty lucky. We're pretty lucky in that respect to you know our positioning for you know f- for connection with these you know th- these um these businesses for sure. You mentioned the the relief and the focus that letting go of a restaurant has given you during this time. Do you see yourself owning another a venue, or do you think that owning one restaurant is enough pressure? Uh, look, I I think that you know that day that we saw Bombini, I was like, never again. And I think about two days later, I was like, okay, what's next? <laughs> and, and it's hard to not. Uh, let the imagination run wild because I think we always have so many ideas and and especially now that the mind's a little bit freer and only has the one venue to think about um, we're always talking about the next thing for us but I said I think we just I want to put all our focus into um building up saddles and there's a lot more opportunity there and there's a lot of things we haven't done it's sort of it's almost like sold itself so we we want to sort of create some some more ventures at you know sort of alongside saddles and you know at the moment uh we we are working on a few things but I think they're more so the doomsday prep sort of if this happens again what do we what do we you know pop up into and how do we utilize all our utilize all our staff but um you know never say never I guess (laughs) never say never (laughs) who knows (laughs) can you tell us some of the things on the doomsday list that you've created besides making sure you've got plenty of champagne stocked up in the (laughs) the cellar okay that's that's number one (laughs) always have champagne um so number two we've just been doing a we've been working with our um you know, restaurant manager and head chef into building little pop-up concepts. So, um, and from everything from like we build a, we build, let's say it's Mexican. We build the Mexican menu. It's got 10 items. We're ready to go. We've got the late, we've got the branding. We've, we've got the Instagram set up. We've got everything ready to go. So we're registering like lots of little things to, and we've, and, you know, we're, we're seeking out little spaces in, um, I guess more populated suburban areas uh, that we can just sort of pop into for a couple of months, and you know who knows that might be actually become a real concept. But at the moment, it's just sort of bred out of just what what if, you know. Um, but I think it's fun anyway. I think it's it's sort of a you know even though it's not something that's a revenue making idea at the moment, it's just things that we're doing together as a team that. You know they're a bit exciting, and they keep they keep the staff, I guess, engaged, and they keep us all thinking about you know if if another opportunity does come along, then how we're going to I guess work that together, and 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 you know how we do work together on bringing it bringing it to life. Has this time changed uh, the offering at Saddles and what you may do with that in the future because of the pandemic? Yeah, for sure. Uh, I think that it's changed our 
there's a few things. It's probably changed our our takeaway like offering for sure, made it more substantial and more, for, you know, it was sort of just there just because before, but now we're putting a little bit more effort into it and making sure that um, it is substantial enough for people to enjoy. Um, I think that the pandemic, if you're saying offering, I think that it structured the business a little bit different. So the offering is, you know, and I'm not saying that I really particularly like it's made it a bit more structured, you know, dining times and this and that. But I mean, as far as menu, we haven't really, we've restricted our times a little bit just to max maximize um, our staff and, you know, make it streamline it a little bit, but we haven't really changed as such the format of the way that we do things. Um, and I guess we will a little bit when we can start doing more, you know, at, at the moment it's, t- you know, small tables and there's, it's quick dining and it's not, it's not, you know, favorable, favorable to, you know, special events or anything like that. But I think once we get into that point, we, we will implement a few new things for sure. And we have some, we have some cool things that we're working on for 2021. So, um, yeah, I think in hope that we're on the other side of COVID. <laughs> You've you've had some real positives and challenges during this time. Has, has it has it changed you? I th- yeah, hundred percent. It has. Yes, it has changed me. I feel like that for me, it's changed the way that I work on the business. I feel like before I was working in the business a lot, um, and I would working in the business is makes it sometimes hard to do those things, the, the planning and the leading and the creating and, and you sort of get lost in the day-to-day. And if I feel like the one big positive is that I feel like I'm a little bit on top of it at the moment and I can sort of be that person, you know, moving and creating a bit of change um, and, and I have more time for the staff and I have more time for me. So we went for a for how many years we've opened, we've had restaurants, we've always had, we've always worked night. And at the moment where we've got this little, you know, regional restaurant that it trades at the moment only day. Um, and so we, we've been doing things that, um, you know, and, and sort of starting new activities and hobbies outside of work that we probably wouldn't have had the opportunity or we didn't create the opportunity for ourselves before. So I think that's been a really positive change for me personally. There's been no doubt that the pandemic has been devastating to many in the industry, but it's also um, shone a light on some of the issues in the industry. Do you think there's some positives for the industry to come out of this? Yeah, for sure. I feel that positives, um, you know, there are, and what I already seen with my team is the positive with um, with my team is that the appreciation for their work or the appreciation to have a job really um, because it's not until you're without one that you understand and, and and it's not until you understand the workings of how what it takes to run the restaurant that they have an appreciation. I think that that's number one. Um, I feel like that the community is is way more conscious of supporting local business and I do uh, and and they've you know and you see them rally around um, and really want to you know uh, want to support or give ideas or and I still have you know some of my regulars emailing hey what a you know what about this what about this you know they, they do it a lot and I and I really appreciate it because I think that they're they're really invested in in the business um, and you know I, I guess a positive and maybe and hopefully customer travel like or guest travel may change forever and and even if it does then our local our local trade and our local um guest or you know or or your database will will continue to to grow and, and be consistent so i feel like that it is a huge shift 
um, in the market. And, you know, and I'm only speaking for regional New South Wales and I know that there's a lot of people doing it. And a lot of my girlfriends in the city, like everyone are doing it very tough. And I, and I feel horrible for um, being so positive sometimes, but I can only be our experience. And, and I know that, you know, during the start of the pandemic, they were maybe doing better than we were. So I feel like that um, we can just take it for what it is right now and be really thankful that we are open and we are trading and we are um, busy and, and, and just, and take it as long as we can (laughs) and not, and not take it, not take it for granted. Well, I think you got onto something pretty early. A good friend of mine believes that you should always drink champagne when you have good or bad news because <laughs> it'll always solve every problem. Always. <laughs> Hayley, it, it's been amazing having you on Deep in the Weeds. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, keep in touch and we'll talk again soon. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for having me. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPA community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well.